Fox NFL Sunday host. He has a new book he's uh, worked on for two years, Losing Isn't Everything, the untold stories and hidden lessons behind the toughest losses in sports history, now available in bookstores and online. Some of the, and sometimes losing is more interesting than yeah. winning. You know, I, I think so, and, and you've been in this business like I have for a long time. And we see people win, and we know what happens to them in general. You know, they get to go to Disneyland, they get to do the commercials and those kinds of things. But when you find out, people say you learn more from losing. That is true, but also what happens to these people? Because at least my approach with the book was almost as much psychological as it was about what happened in the moment and, and how'd you blow this player, or how'd you come up short, John Van Devel, those kinds of things. How it affected them and their families and, and their history and the people around them. Because everybody in this book, their legacy is they lost. You know, John Van Devel blew the lead of the British Open. Calvin Schiraldi lost game six and seven. Uh, you know, Mary Decker fell at the Olympics. Pete Carroll lost in the Super Bowl in the play that people can't believe. You know, those kinds of things, that becomes their legacy that people talk about year in and year out. Is there any, who was reluctant to talk? That did do it? Yeah. Um, Pete Carroll want to talk about that call at the goal line? No, yeah, he did. He did. He, he was open about it. You know, I, I think one of the things is... And is, Craig Elo, you have him where Jordan hits the shot on Craig. And, and Craig's thing was, you know, that he didn't deal with it and wound up years later having to go to drug rehab that he directly says was his response to not having confronted his legacy was that everybody, everywhere he went, that he said for, for the next 10 years, people said, you're the guy that's on the poster that Jordan hit the shot over. And he immediately after the shot, he said they didn't talk about it in the locker room because you remember that was the end of the game. Yeah. Elo had scored 24 points in that game, including the bucket that put Cleveland up by one with three seconds left, and then Jordan hits the shot over him. He said his wife didn't talk, his family didn't talk, everybody left him alone. So he buried it, and all these years later wound up getting hooked on oxycodone, uh, went to drug rehab. First day there, one of the counselors that's walking him around goes, hey, aren't you that guy? That, and he's like, look, I'm, I'm here to get help. Yeah. So he had to deal with it like that. Um, I think Calvin Schiraldi's an interesting one because everybody blames Buckner for that ball going through his legs in game six. But if you go back to the game, Boston had a one-run lead in the clinch, what would have been the clinching game. In the eighth inning, Giraldi blew that out of the bullpen. They had a two-run lead in the tenth. Giraldi gets the first two outs and then gives up three straight hits to blow that lead. So he loses game six, putting everything into motion for Buckner. Comes in in game seven, 3-3 three, three tie in the seventh inning. Gives up a home run to Ray Knight. Loses game six and seven. And he admitted that mentally he never got over that moment. He only pitched at the majors four more years, retired at the age of 29. I don't think he's blamed, though, for 86, but, and, though, and Kurt, that, right? And that, that, to me, was the interesting thing, thing. Why does history look at some people and blame them for losing and other people who are really responsible for the losses skate? And he said in his mind he obviously was responsible because he blew game six and seven, but the play wasn't shown over and over and over and over like the Buckner thing is. And that bothered him as much because in his mind, in his words, you know, Buckner took a lot of bleep that he probably shouldn't have um but he buried that he didn't deal with it and finally in 2013 27 years after 1986 his wife told him look we're getting a divorce unless you go to therapy because you're not the same guy that i married that w was in the minors because he said in his defense he put up walls that was the only way he knew how to deal with it um and his father later committed suicide not because of that but he said he saw the way his father handled things and what it led to and he did not want to be that guy and with his wife coming to him so almost 30 years later, he's still dealing with it. It's amazing. What was the story that you didn't know? Now, you interviewed everybody, yeah. I think. Yes. That, that, and you're talking about Calvin Schiraldi, Craig Elo, um, Bill Curry and Lou Michaels. That was uh, the, uh, the Jets Joe, Joe, the Namath, Colts. Joe yeah. Namath upset. Mm -hmm. um, Aaron Crickstein facing Jimmy Connors at the U.S. Open. Ron Washington, the Rangers manager, um, who was fired by they, – they lost the World Series. He was mm -hmm. fired, had the cocaine – uh, issue as well. Reed Geddes, who played for Fi Slamma Jamma. Al Downing, who gave up 715 to Hank Aaron. Uh, two of the guys on the Kentucky team that didn't guard Christian Leitner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Mary Decker. Rodney Harrison, the helmet catch. Your guy. Yep. Yes. Uh, Everson Walls, who was supposed to be trying to guard Dwight Clark, right. who had the catch against the Cowboys. Dan Jansen, the speed skater, and, uh, and then Pete Carroll from uh, 2015. What, uh, who told the story that made you go... I'm glad I did this. You, you know, I, I think the Chiraldi thing, for one, just to find out that here's a guy who's carrying this burden that most of us don't even look at as a burden for 30 years. Uh, and two things. I think Rodney Harrison, his thing was interesting because we know him. He's in every time you see this David Tyree catch. Yeah. He's there trying to defend it. He said physically he thought he knocked the ball away. 
you know, he, he thought he swatted away, and he heard Steve Smith go, get off of him, good catch. And he's like, good catch, what? And he looked, and he saw he had the ball. But that play bothered him because he's used to being the guy who makes the play. What bothered him even more, though, was the touchdown pass. He says Dean Pease, the defensive coordinator, called a blitz on the play. He looks over after they get lined up. He's in charge of the defense. Sees five foot nine Ellis Hobbs lined up against six foot five Plexico Burris, and he goes, "I know right away it's a touchdown." So I say, "Let's call off the blitz." Junior Seau, who was on that team, had not won a Super Bowl, said, "No, let's run it." And he goes, "No, let's call it off." And Junior goes, "No, let's run it." And he said, out of his admiration for Junior, because when he came in as a rookie, a fifth round pick in San Diego, Junior took him under his wing. He ran the blitz when he knew that he should not have. Wound up being a touchdown. He said he didn't even turn around as soon as the ball was thrown because he knew. And he admitted that had that been any other player, Teddy Bruschi or anybody else, that he would have called off the blitz. He would have said, no, this is the right thing to do. But he admired Junior so much and wanted to help him try to get a ring that he let them go on the blitz, and that, and that wound up being the game-winning touchdown. We're talking to Kurt Menefee, Fox NFL Sunday host. The book is Losing Isn't Everything, the untold stories and hidden lessons behind the toughest losses in sports history, available in bookstores. You go back to Craig Elo, could not have played better defense on Jordan on that jumper. It's just Craig goes up, stays up, Jordan continues to keep going up, and then Craig comes down, Jordan's still up, and then hits the jumper. Rodney couldn't have played a better right. defensive position on, you know, David Tyree. Yeah, and, and that's why I, that catch bothers him simply because he said he's used to making plays, and he didn't. But the touchdown bothers him even more because that was a mental error, and that was something he could control. You talk about the ELO situation with Jordan, and that goes back to, he says, they had not double teamed, Cleveland hadn't, anybody all year long. They get in the timeout, and Lenny Wilkins goes, we're going to double team him. So they go back on the court, and they're discussing, how do we do this? Where do we stand? How far <laughs> apart? The, the guys didn't know. So there was some question in their mind before the ball was even inbounded. Then physically, he's trying to fly by Jordan. He says Jordan hung up there forever. He hits the shot. So you get some insight like that. Um, you know, one of the things Ron Washington talked about was the David Freeze hit. You know, they, I mean, they were one strike away from yeah. winning the World Series. Mm -hmm. And that, and, and again, I think it, it comes off, I don't want it to sound like they're blaming people, but he says Nelson Cruz, they had him in no doubles. And he and Gary Pettis... No, playing so there's no doubles. Playing so the there's gap. no doubles, yeah. right, exactly. And so Ron and Gary Pettis were in the dugout, and they didn't notice that just slowly that Nelson had creeped in, and he took a few steps, and so he was out of position. And so when that ball went over his head, he froze also as soon as the ball was hit. Yeah. Um, but had he been in the right position, that ball is probably caught. The game is over. The Rangers win the World Series. And again, he wasn't blaming him. He was saying, you know, look, this, things just happen. They happen in a game, and you're not paying attention to everything. And uh, the rest is history. Are the Cubs a better story now that they won or when they didn't win? You know, I think they were – my wife's from Chicago, so I have to be careful, you know. Yeah. I, I think the Cubs, though, it's almost like Boston. The Red Sox were a fascinating story when they didn't win. As soon as they won one, it was a great story. Then they went a second, it's like, yeah, okay. And then they went to third, it's like, yeah, okay. You know, now they're just another good team. Yeah. And I think that that's the jeopardy that the Cubs have. I'm sure they'll take it. But you look at that team, everybody's 23, 24, 25. They're probably going to win another or two. And I, I think they're less fascinating. They're less lovable from a national standpoint now that they won one. Maybe Cleveland will become that team. You also guest host uh, on uh, the Bruce Springsteen channel. So you mm -hmm. did, you had a, an hour playlist of Springsteen songs. Yeah. Now, are you... I'm always the one black guy at the Springsteen concert. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that's me. <laughs> that sounds like a song by, yeah. by Bruce. Yeah. Um, or Donald Trump. Yeah, you never know. Um, now, so when you're putting that list together, mm -hmm. in, in any part of your mind, do you think Springsteen could hear this? Yes. You, you do. I mean, come on. It's, it is to the back. And you're going, he's probably not really sitting in the car, driving around, listening to his own channel, you know? I mean, that's a, a little bit more ego than I think he's got. But You, you mean like me watching reruns of this show, <laughs> like when I get home? You're in the breaks, aren't you? You gotta check out the last segment <laughs> yeah. to see how you did. So, no, Have it, you met Springsteen? Yeah, a couple times, actually. So, you know, I, I originally um, knew Terry McGovern, who, if you're a Springsteen fan, Terry's song was done for him after Terry passed away. Could have not have been a nicer man on this planet but terry was his road manager so i met bruce actually in spain once in barcelona with uh terry and then i know his current road manager whose name i probably won't throw out there since he's still alive and i don't want people bugging him but i've met bruce uh with him as well and i also know his head of security who is a really good friend and comes out and sees us at fox and so i know enough people around him that i've been introduced to him a couple of times yes your favorite springsteen song 
Um, my favorite Springsteen song is the live version of The Ghost of Old Times Yode because I, I'm a big Tom Morello fan, and the, the guitar riff he does on that is Cub, unbelievable. Cub, Cub fan, too. Yeah, exactly. I met him a couple weeks ago, actually, at a sushi restaurant in the Valley. So. Well, see, you only work on Sunday. You've got all this time. To, I mean, i got too many damn jobs. I'm not, this is who I hang with, Kurt. Yeah, well, you know what? But you've got a, a, a more, you're a man of the people. I don't want to be a man of the people. <laughs> I'm hanging with Springsteen yeah. and Tom Morello. Yeah. Last night, you know who I ran into last night? I don't know. You're a Dave Matthews guy. Yeah. Carter Beaufort, the yeah. drummer. Yeah. Ran into him last night. You know, it's like this is this is the now circle that, I roll in. That guy is a cool cat. He is. He really is. I met him a couple years ago through Howie Long with Howie uh, at an event uh, for the Boys and Girls Club that Howie does every year back in Charlottesville. And so we ran into each other last night, big hug, and it was he was celebrating his birthday. So. Good dude. This, this can, yeah. It, well, it I, I went to see them in Hartford, and I, I met Dave on a movie set with Sandler. And so I went backstage to meet him before the concert, and uh, he said, let me take you to uh, introduce you to somebody who actually knows what you do for a living. Because Dave doesn't know anything about sports. Okay. Nothing. So we go down the hall, and all of a sudden, we take a left, and Carter's in there. And he goes, um, Carter, do you know who this is? <laughs> and then he goes, of course. Right. And then Dave goes, I don't. Why don't you guys talk? <laughs> and so he left me in there with Carter, and uh, he, he went back to his he room. He basically dropped you off, and Carter was yes, your babysitter. Did. That's he, all it was. He, he did. Yeah. He did. Uh, good luck with the book. Thank you so much. Thanks yeah. for having me, Dan. Yeah. You know, it's one of the things, that, I don't know how much time we have here. I don't want to take this and run with it too long. But everybody always talks about how cool you are and what a good guy you are. I'm supposed to, your son's birthday is this weekend, too, by the way, isn't uh, it? The 29th. Jack. Yeah. yeah, another mutual friend. See, I know people that know people. Wow. So that's how it wow. is. Well, but anyway, I'm supposed to say hi for that. But one of the things is is that a lot of people, and I'm 100% serious about this. I listen to you guys as I drive into the gym, and believe it or not, I go to the gym in L.A. Uh, <laughs> every morning. <laughs> and so I listen to you guys. But one of the things that I respect about you so much in this business, because, you know, Howie makes the joke you can't have two quarterbacks in the same room. A lot of people think you can't have two guys who are show hosts in the same room because the ego is getting away. And you're never like that. I mean, you're just you're not just a man of the people. You're a real guy. Uh, and you, you also know that your audience is smart enough. It's not like they go, well, there's Kurt Menefee who's on Fox, and I'm on NBC, and my gosh, I'm going to switch channels or whatever. People, oh, I don't. They, they take in everything. And uh, my point is that doesn't bother you. No. But there are people in this business that refuse to be seen in the same place that somebody on another network is. And you're not like that. That's one of the things I respect and I love about you. And I appreciate you having me. Well, it's I want the competition, but it doesn't mean that I, I don't embrace the competition. Right. Or if somebody says, well, he's a better host than you. I mean, that's it, that doesn't even factor in. I'm it, the same way. It's, it's like some of, people like vanilla, some people like strawberry. You know, everybody's got different tastes, but I don't think you have to be an enemy just because you work at, you know, one works at well, Coke and the other works at Pepsi. When we were at the mothership, though, uh, yeah, we felt uh, they, we it was us against the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and it goes the other way. And that's it's kind of part of the point I'm making in that, you know, there are people that are over, the people that are over there are fine. I, I think most of, the, most of the people that are on air, you run into them in a, in a private setting or whatever. Everybody's cool. Um, but when it comes to even like publicity for the book, oh, no, you can't be with him or you can't have him on your show. Or you can't do this. And it's just like, OK, you know, the reason why when I started this, the one thing I said is management cannot be involved. Mm -hmm. And I said, if, if you promise and my boss has never been involved. Chris, Chris Long at DirecTV has never gotten involved. He just said, you have it on, I hired you, and that's... Because I said, I want to have ESPN people on, or mm -hmm. Fox, or whoever it is. Mm -hmm. I don't care what the competition is. If the story is there to be told, I'm doing it for the audience. Right. That's the most important person here who's sitting in the car right now listening to you talk about your book. That's who we serve. So. And they don't care about the different networks. Because no, they, they know don't. it. I mean, yeah. it's, it's not like they don't know it. They know everybody works different places. And as you said, if it's interesting, it's interesting. But thank you. But don't stab me in the back and try to take my job on Football Night in America. <laughs> well, I've got a pretty good one at Fox NFL Sunday, though. So, you know. Oh, so you think that's better than Football Night in America? Uh, well, if you want to get down to it, I would, I would keep the Greek gig that I have over the gig that you have. This is just me for, for me personally. What if, Everybody, what some if people like strawberry, America? some people like vanilla, and I like getting up early on Sunday mornings and living in Los Angeles and doing multiple games a week. That's just me. What if I gave you Football Night in America in Los Angeles and Fox NFL Sunday in New York? You know what? If you throw in the Olympics... Oh, yeah, that's part of it. Okay, okay. Well, we may have a deal, though. We may have to talk. Oh, no, we're not <laughs> trading. <laughs> Yo, I thought you were making me an offer. No, I don't want to go out there and get up early. I'm telling you how great Los Angeles is, and you can work. I, was just, I just told you it was a great gig. You should take it. Tell Terry I said hello, because Terry 
won't come on the show because we had a little exchange where he talked about using steroids back in the 70s uh, to come back from an injury, not steroids to get bigger. And, right. And I, and I felt bad about that because I, I, I think he's great. And then, you know, he had a problem with that. And I'm like, I'm not outing you for using steroids. You said it. And then I wanted to know about that. So, right. Okay. I'll make sure I apologize I, I'm sure I just made it worse. Yeah, didn't I? exactly. Absolutely. Yes. yes. What, what, it sure was going really well. Helped yeah. the cause. What'd he say? What, what'd he say, Kurt? Yeah. What, what, what'd he say? <laughs> uh, the book is Losing Isn't Everything. Kurt Menefee, Fox NFL Sunday host. Probably the next host of Football Night in America. <laughs> the Dan Patrick Show. Weekday mornings on Audience.